from New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays with John Chapman. Best Plays, the series of hour-length dramas selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now John Chapman, editor of the theatrical yearbook Best Plays and drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory in Patrick Hamilton's Rope. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Patrick Hamilton of London is one of the best men at the business of scaring innocent audiences like yourselves. He has a fondness for writing about characters who are somewhat on the lunatic side. Previously on this program, you may have heard Angel Street. But anyhow, you must know it. And you'll remember the sinister Mr. Manningham who tried to make his wife as crazy as he was. This evening's best play is Mr. Hamilton's Rope which was a Broadway success some years back under the title Rope's End. In Rope, we shall meet some rather weird characters and hear some strange events. The two principal characters in this cat-and-mouse drama about a murder in the usually calm precincts of Oxford University will be played by Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory. Are you ready? All right, we'll begin. It is dark in the room. The light from the street lamp outside throws shadows against the ceiling. And even in the half-light, these moving figures seem to be dancing, circling in some primitive rite about the chest. The lock. It won't. Give it to me. That's it. There it is. Close tight. Stop there. No. Don't put on the light. Steady, Grano. You all right? Grano. Give me a match. (laughs) You all right? It's time you pulled yourself together. Brandon, you understand what we've done? Yes. I know what I've done. I've committed murder. Passionless, faultless, and clueless murder. Yes, Brandon. An immaculate murder. I have killed. I have killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. Yet I am alive. May I put on the light now? No. Brandon, when he... When Ronald came in, you were standing at the door. Yes, Did you see anyone standing there, up the street? No. There was someone. There was a man. I saw him. I remember. Well? Nothing. Brandon? Yes? When I met Ronald coming out of the Coliseum, when I met him, why shouldn't someone have seen us? Did we think of that, Brandon? I did. Do you think we'll get away with it? You mean later this evening? Do you think some psychic force emanating from that chest there is going to advise Sir Johnston Kentley that within is the lifeless entire... Stop it! ...of his only son and heir? Listen. 
Now, what is it, Grenillo? What is... Listen. I thought it was Sabo. Sabo will not be here until five minutes to nine. Mathematics is important, Grenner. At two o'clock, Ronald Kentley leaves his father's house. After tea, in this room, precisely at 6.45, he is done to death by strangulation and rope. And then... Let it alone! Tonight at nine, his father and several well-chosen friends of our own will be here for a light entertainment. And then, after... This party isn't a slip, is it, Brent? My dear Grano, have we not agreed that the entire beauty and piquancy of the evening is in the party itself? At eleven, you and I leave by car for Oxford, and our fellow undergraduate here at present is never heard from again. That is the perfection of criminality. I am quite lucid, am I not? Yes. The party itself, so far from being our most vulnerable point, is the very apex and consummation of our feat. Consider its ingredients. First, Sir Johnston Kentley, his father. He lends the macabre quality to the evening. And then I... Brent! Answer it. Hello? What? This is Mayfair 6143. What? Brandon, put out that light! Put out Reynolds, that light! put down the telephone. You're telling London you're afraid. Put it down. That's better. Now, the party. Perfect. Perfect. The father, Kenneth Ragland. I don't like that, Brendan. Ronald's best friend. But that's precisely the pleasure of it. The same youth, the same lack of intelligence. The one dead in the chest, the other alive, unknowing. And Lila, Lila, so much in love with him. Brendan, don't touch it. And now we come to Rupert. A very intriguing proposition. A man who might see this thing from our angle, the artistic one. You know, I even toyed with the idea of inviting him to share our dangers. Rupert is a poet, brilliant, capable of comprehending the beauty and the enchantment of this. What time is it? But Rupert remains in as blissful ignorance as the others. The crowning touch, the one man who could appreciate it, is kept in ignorance. We choose not to share with him. May I put on the light now? Go on. I'm all right. I'm better now. I thought you were going to lose your nerve for a moment, Grano. So did I. But I haven't. Easy. Well, let me alone. Just remember that. You idiot! I told you to clean up in here. What's the matter? Ronald's ticket to the Coliseum. It's caught under this chest here. Help me get it out. It's tearing! Now, wait, wait. I'll lift the chest. All right. How in heaven's name? Grenillo, do you realize we could hang on that? Brendan, listen. That's Sabo. Now quiet yourself and sit down. The ticket! In your pocket. There. In here, Sabo. The evening paper, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Grano, you don't want to drink before dinner, do you? But I... Was do I... you? All right. Excuse me, sir. The table in the dining room, it's covered with books. Yes, you may lay the table here. Here? On the chest. Oh, but I could bring the table from upstairs, sir. Oh, no, set it here. On the chest. Very good, sir. Ah, here we are. Early, whoever it is. In here, sir? Yes, in here. Very good, sir. Hello. This way, sir. Hello, Raglan. Hello there. Oh, I, I say, I, I'm terribly sorry. I've come dressed. My fault entirely. Do sit down. I should have explained. We are going up to Oxford tonight. Oh, no. Are you? Drink with gin and Italian. We leave tonight about 12. The place is simply covered with books. Uh, I see. Here you are. Thanks. You see, I've... 
I've come into a library. Of course, books aren't entirely your line, are they, Kenneth? Uh, no, not really. Only P.G. Woodhouse. An uncle of mine died just lately, and I have his library. It was bestowed on me. It broke up Sir Johnston Kentley. He had his eye on the collection for himself. He'll be here directly. You mean old Kentley lives in Grosvenor Square? Ronnie's father? Yes, Ronnie's father. Of course, you know Ronnie. Oh, rather. You mean you're having Sir Johnston here just to have him grind his teeth with envy over your books? On the contrary. I'm going to let him have exactly what he wants, provided I don't want it. That explains the mess that we're in. Mess? Well, you'll observe we're having our meal off a chest. Oh, yes, yes. I thought it looked odd. Your man laying a cloth on it. Here we are. Mm, I wonder if that's Rupert. Did you ever meet Rupert, Kenneth? Rupert Cadell? Uh, no, I can't say I have. Not your set, I imagine. This way, madam. Thank you. Ah, the ravishing Lila. <laughs> you know Grano, don't you? Hello. Hello, Kenneth. Missed you at tennis this morning. Bad night, you know. Kenneth's having gin and Italian. I'd adore one. You'll have to excuse our mess. I've just been telling Kenneth. I've come into a library. Come into a library? My dear, how weird. And I hope you don't think you'll get much to eat, because we're off to Oxford tonight, and so we're being very humble. Well, I had a simply gluttonous tea. Just gorge, my dear. Here you are. Oh, thank you. You know, I feel most ghastly dressed. Boiled shirt and all. Why? I'm sure you couldn't tell. I guessed myself. It's not proper cocktail time. Too early for dinner. The whole thing is weird and mysterious. What do you mean, weird and mysterious? Well, what? Don't you think it is? I mean, well, I just feel it is. Here we are. I'll bet that's old Kentley. I didn't know you were having Ronnie's father. Oh, yes. He's to look at the books. Ah, how do you do, Grinello? Brand how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, ah, Lila, uh, where's my son? I'm sure I haven't the faintest, Sir Johnston. Is he coming here? I don't think so. I couldn't get in touch with him. Gin and Italian, Sir Johnston. What? Oh, oh, certainly not. Won't you sit down, Sir Johnston, this armchair? We're going to feed from the chest, as it were. You'll be quite close to it here. The chest? It's, uh, it's not a cassoni, is it? Uh, perhaps if I look more closely... No, sir, it's not genuine. It's a reproduction, but it's rather a nice piece. Do you like it? Eh? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. And uh, Now, uh, those books I'm to see, where are they? They're in the other room, the dining room. There's more space in there. I, I shall be interested to see them. Wickham had a remarkable lot of Shakespeareana. Well, I'm afraid the folios were sold off before he died. Oh, pity. There's a deal of Baconian stuff. I'm told it's very fine. Hello, Brandon. Am I late? Rupert, the last as usual. Do come in. I'll keep my sticks, Abel. Oh, of course. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Cadell, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do? Kenneth Ragland. How do you do? Miss Arden. How do you do? Tell me, have I come dressed or undressed? <laughs> oh, I see there's several shades of opinion. I wasn't able to inquire. Well, what's this? A chest. We're having supper off a chest, Rupert. Oh, are we? Yes. Why? Because it's a very nice chest. And because the table in the dining room is covered with books. Rupert, aren't you going to have a cocktail? No, thank you. I've I've had four already. Sabo, I'll ring when we're through and you make clear. Very good, sir. When do we begin the meal, Brandon? Personally, I'm I'm famished. And we've been waiting for you, Rupert. Now, there are lots of plates and knives and sandwiches, caviar and whatnot. Now gather round and help yourselves. Oh, I suppose good. I could manage I'm a little. Sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's the delicious. I'd love to have your two of them. Uh, are you the mm -hmm. great Cadell then? The great Cadell, sir. And what do you know about me? I've read your poems, some of them. No, I, I knew a Cadell once. Uh, Louisa Cadell, horrible old hag she was too. Dear heaven, the young man is alluding to my aunt. Oh, I say, I'm terribly sorry. Have I dropped a brick? No, you have said a mouthful. Frankly, I could cheerfully murder her. Murder? Mm, with glee. A horrible old woman. The world would be well rid of her. You wouldn't, Mr. Cadell. Mm, why not? You'd be hauled into Old Bailey and brought to justice. I've heard of people being brought to Old Bailey, but seldom to justice. Uh, I hope you're not confusing the two. I say you're not one of those people who doesn't approve of capital punishment. Possibly. I approve of murder too much to approve of capital punishment. You approve of murder, Rupert? Of course. There are so many people I would so willingly murder, mostly members of my own family. 
Furthermore, I have already committed murder myself. How do you get that? You, my friends, have paradoxically a horror of murder on a small scale and a veneration for it on a large. One gentleman murders another in a back alleyway in London for, let us say, the gold fillings in his teeth. And all society shrieks for revenge upon the miscreant. But when the entire manhood of one nation rises up to go slaughter another, lacking even the excuse of the gold fillings, that society condones and applauds and calls it war. Really, Mr. Goodell? I... I carry my cane as a souvenir of my career of murder. Why, you'd be the first to be horrified by real murder if it appeared under your nose. I wonder. You must have some moral standards. Really? I can't recall any. You wouldn't hurt a fly. Wouldn't I? I've hurt thousands of my time. Tell me, Miss... Miss Arden, have you moral standards? Lila? Oh, She believes in the Ten Commandments. Oh, surely not. Why? What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing whatever. I have no doubt they were of profound significance to the nomadic needs of the tribe to which they were delivered. Their inadequacy for a day must be sufficient to condemn them. I don't believe it's possible to observe a one of them. The only one I'm sincerely capable of adhering to is that little stricture concerning my neighbor's ox and my neighbor's ass... And I don't believe I've got a neighbor so equipped. (laughs) (laughs) Although it might be different if I lived in a rural area. (laughs) Oh, oh, no, I'm afraid I approve of murder most heartily. Oh, oh, oh. Spilled the wine. Look, must we eat on this chest? I'm afraid so, Rupert. Let me pour you another glass. Well, thank you. Lady Kentley any better, Sir Johnston? Yes, I'm afraid she's still in bed. And how's Ronald getting on? Merely idling, just like you and Grinello here. Does he like it, or does he want to get back to Oxford? Oh, Grinello, he doesn't want to get back. He has a great time. Do... Do I remember seeing Ronald's portrait in the papers recently? Something something about uh, winning the high jump or some other form of violent exercise. That's right. Oh, yes, 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 I do remember. I remember quite well. There was a picture of me right next to it. Was there? I didn't know you were athletic, Mr. Cadell. Oh, no, no. There had been some unpleasant with, with my publisher, and he was suing me for breach of contract. Ronald looked quite the healthier of the two photographs. So I remember he was some six feet off the ground, hovering over the bar. <laughs> yes, he's a sprightly lad, is Ronald. Lively, full of life. <coughs> All right, Grano. <coughs> Yes, yes. Went down the wrong way. Ronald's rather like Kenneth here, don't you think so? Good heavens, no. But he is. Oh, in what way? His sort of general youthfulness. Ronald's rather like Kenneth here, don't you think so? Good heavens, no. But he is. Oh, in what way? His sort of general youthfulness, too. I'm I'm afraid they won't feel like that for long. No, they won't. Poor chap. Now, look here, Bam. Oh, don't quarrel with him, Ragland. The rest of us envy your clear-eyed youth and certain physical well-being. I, uh, I had not realized the pleasure of mere walking until I found it necessary to hobble. Uh, I, I say, uh, you, you really don't... Uh, 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 I mean, you, you'd hardly notice the... Uh... I mean, oh, sir... Don't concern yourself, Ragland. In artistic circles, a limp is considered an asset. It um, sets one off. But really, I didn't mean to... You see what I mean. The same youthful clumsiness. Puppies gambling amidst the porcelain. You share that quality with Ronald, Kenneth. Youth. Youth? <laughs> I'd say they were infantile. Ronald's only passion in holiday time is the movies. When I saw him at lunch, he was off to the Coliseum. Oh? But that's not the movies. That's a music hall, isn't it? I've heard. I've never been there in my life. I thought everyone had been to the Coliseum. Well, I haven't. Neither have I. Is that the place in the Haymarket? Do you mean to tell me, Granilo, that you have never been to the Coliseum? No, I haven't. Oh. Oh, dear, dear. (laughs) Why should he have? Oh, I really don't know. It just strikes me as, um, odd. Oh. Oh. You know, I'm coming to the conclusion that there's some ulterior motive about this chest picnic. What do you mean, ulterior motive? 
You mean it's done purely to make you spill things over your trousers? Mm. Something like that. Oh, I suspect much worse than that. I think they've committed a murder, and that chest is simply chock full of rotting bones. It's just the sort of thing for rotting bones, isn't it? Uh, it is, isn't it? My dear, you're right. I wouldn't let you see the inside of that chest for worlds. And don't you try to bluff me out and pretend you're willing to let me see one. But, my dear, that's just what I said I wouldn't do. Yes, <laughs> but surely a murderer, having chopped up and concealed his victim in a chest, uh, wouldn't invite all his friends to come round and eat off it. Not unless he were a very stupid and conceited murderer. Very stupid and very conceited. Which, of course, he might be. In fact, it's exactly what all criminals are. Oh, no. I don't think so. Well, now how about the books? We can all go in and browse about for a bit. Excellent. Uh, uh, Brandon, you say there's a good deal of Baconian material. I Come on, Kenneth. Let's pretend we both can read. Well, books aren't exactly in my line, but I say the last P.G. Woodhouse was absolute wizard. <laughs> well, Rupert, not interested in books? Only my own. You... You look fagged out, Grano. Do I? I don't feel it. No? Look, what have you been doing with yourself? Doing with myself? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, touchy, Grano. I was sleeping most of the afternoon. Always puts me out for the rest of the day. Writing anything lately? Yes. A little thing about doves and a little thing about rain. Both good. Very good, in fact. And, of course, I'm getting ahead with the big work. Is that going well? Oh, yes, very. Indeed, it promises to be not only the very best thing I have ever written, but the best thing I have ever read. Uh, may, may I have that ashtray, if you don't mind? I'll just reach across you. Oh! Oh, oh I'm sorry. Sorry to have bumped into you. Yeah, yeah. So, you and Brandon leave tonight for Oxford. That's right. Arriving about three in the morning. A peculiar form of enjoyment. Why? Lovely moonlight night. Moonlight, it's raining. It's not. Open the window and see. It is coming down. It's quite a dismal night, in fact. On such a night as this, there should be portents. Blood in the streets, you know. What do you mean, blood? Classical illusion. Oh. Uh, would you want another, Rupert? No, you go ahead. A night like this demands a stiff bracer, eh, Grano? Yeah. Uh, yes. Grano. Hello? Grano, you're wanted. In here. I'm coming. Uh, c come along, Rupert. I'm all right in here. Uh, won't you join us? Grano. Oh, no. All right. Excuse me, Rupert. Not at all. Hmm. Beg pardon, sir? Uh, oh, yes, Sabo? I must clear, sir. I'll go right ahead. Thank you, sir. Oh, it's going to be a dirty night, eh, Sabo? Yes, sir. I suppose Mr. Brandon's still going. I suppose so, sir. Uh, can I pour you some more coffee, Mr. Cadell? No, no, sir, no, thank you. Have you been getting into trouble lately, Sabo? Yes. Trouble, sir? Yeah. Trouble. What kind of trouble, sir? Why? Have you a selection? Indeed, sir. Life is full of trouble. I mean with your employers. Me, sir? <laughs> no, sir. Why should you think so, sir? Well, I telephoned this house at a quarter to eight, and I heard most hysterical noises. Noises, sir? I was wondering whether you were the cause of it. No, sir. I was not here till five to nine. Oh. You were perhaps at the Colosseum. Uh, pardon, sir, the Colosseum, uh, the music hall? Yeah. No, sir, I haven't been there for many years. No. Not lately? No, sir. Uh, tell me, Sabo. Mr. Brandon, has he... Mr. Brandon, sir? Yes. Mr. Brandon. What's all this about Mr. Brandon. I was asking the good Sabo whether Mr. Brandon would still travel to Oxford in all this rain. Wasn't I, Sabo? 
Uh, uh, yes, sir. I hope he told you we were. Sabu, is a sherry in here? In the cabinet, sir. I'll get it. What's a little rain, anyway? You'll take this inside, Sabo. That'll be all for the evening. Oh, very good, sir. Good evening, Mr. Cadell. Good evening, Sabo. <clears throat> Do sit down, Rupert. Your stalking about like that always makes me nervous. All right, I'll just uh, perch here on the chest. Do. It makes an admirable dais, does it not? Brandon, I just thought of something rather queer. Queer? What's that? All this talk of rotting bones in chests. What about them? Do you remember when you were an infant, Brandon? And huh? We used to sit about your father's fire and you would tell precocious stories to uh, astound your elders. Yes, I remember. Do you remember your chest complex, Brandon? My chest complex? Yes. Whatever the story was, piratical, detective, murder, adventure, or ghost, it always contained a marvelous denouement with a bloody chest containing corpses. Uh, oh, well, just such a one as this one. You had a perfect mania for it. Don't you remember? Yes. I'd forgotten that. What about it, though? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just queer, that's all. You were a morbid child. I suppose so. Have one, Rupert? No. No, thank you. Why did you say queer? No, just queer. Us all talking tonight about rotting bones in chests. It just came back to me, that's all. Oh, I see. Well, happy days, Rupert. How... How's the old man getting on with his books? Going to take the entire library away with him, as far as I can see. I didn't know you were a book collector. What exactly is your line? Well, I've... I've theories about some of the Victorians. Everything comes round, you know, in time. For example? Well, Carlyle, for example. Theories of men who are willing to... Well, rise above others, you know. History is the story of remarkable men. Oh, dear Brandon, Carlyle is an unspeakable person. He's got guts, anyway. And a kind of angry righteousness which you don't get nowadays. Thank heaven. <laughs> well, I must get back to my guess. Aren't you coming, Rupert? Oh, all right. I'll get the light. Oh, I've left the cigarettes. Uh, go along in, Rupert, and I'll be in in a moment. All right. First door on the passage. Right? Right. Brenner! Uh, Brenner, what the devil are you doing in here? Turn, turn on the light, Ben. What's the matter? Tell me what's the matter. I, I thought it was him. I thought it was him. Here, drink this. Why, why were you sitting here? Why were you trying to frighten me? I wasn't trying to frighten you. I wasn't even sure it was you. Why did you want to sneak in like that? You got what you deserved. Hang you, you've upset me. I wanted to see if everything was all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be all right. Give me some more of it. Get hold of yourself. Don't get drunk on that. <coughs> What's the matter? Pull yourself together. Come on, come on. You can stop it if you want to. Brano, come on. <coughs> went down the wrong way. Oh. Let's go back. Ronald's Coliseum ticket. Not so loud. I haven't got it. Don't be a fool, Grano. I gave it to you. You didn't give it to me. Grano. Oh, wait, wait. My pocket. A whiskey pocket? No. Trousers. No. It must be. Which pocket was it, Brent? Look again. No. Look in your wallet. You didn't give it to me. I never had it. I gave it into your hand. You didn't. I never had it. I gave it into your hand. Well, see if you got it. I haven't. Look, look. In every pocket. Remember, we lifted the chest. It was right here, and I gave it to you. Brano, where is it? Where is it? Hear us. I put it in your waistcoat pocket. Where is it now? Where is it now? Here, Brandon. <laughs> what have you lost? My temper, Rupert. 
That's all. I should think so. I heard you pounding on the chest out in the passage. I'm sorry, Grano. That's all right. That's all right. We often have outbursts, eh, Grano? About trifles. Yes. On this occasion, it was a question of a volume of Baconian research which poor old Grano couldn't produce. Odd thing to quarrel about. Yes, but we do quarrel about odd things nowadays, don't we, Grano? We do. Will you join me in another, Rupert? No, thank you. As a matter of fact, I came in here on an errand. An errand? Yes, I wanted some rope. Rope? Yes, luckily I found a piece in the hall in a vase. Just the right length, isn't it? Hello. Here we are. I thought it was coming. In a moment, Act Two of Rope, starring Victor Jory and Herd Hatfield. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening, Victor Jory and Herd Hatfield. And here is your host, drama critic John Chapman. It's time to return to our sinister room and the even more sinister chest. An unseasonable thunderstorm has increased the already heavy tension that pervades this room as Rupert continues his offhand cross-examination of Brandon. Well, quite a storm, eh, Brandon? What... what did you want that rope for, Rupert? Well, the young people are busy, oh, doing up the old man's books, and they need a bit of rope to tie up the... Well, a bit nervous, Grano. Don't like the thunder. Where's Sebo? You'd uh, you'd better mop it up with your handkerchief. Whiskey and varnish are not the best of friends. Did you hear that, Ken? I'm coming. I'm just terrified of thunder, aren't you? Well, I, I wouldn't exactly say that. Be careful with the books, Kenneth. Oh dear, it's simply coming down in sheets, isn't it? Surely you two aren't going up to Oxford tonight. Certainly we are. But you can't. You'll be flooded. Uh, did you locate a piece of rope, Cadell? Yes, sir, I did. Most conveniently tucked away in a vase in the passage. A place, huh? Uh, very odd. <laughs> Not really. Sherlock Holmes kept his tobacco in a Persian slipper. Oh, so he did. All right, Kenneth. You hold the books while I manage the room. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Brandon, I'll go back to the rest of the books. Of course. Don't clean me out, sir. What? Oh, oh no, 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 of course not. Greno. What? Do tear yourself away from the sideboard and see to Sir Johnston inside. In a moment. Will you go in? Now. Just stop for a spot, that's all. He's feeling no pain, eh? Came on quickly. Grano never could hold it. Oh. Oh, listen to that one. Are you afraid of storms, Lila? It's hereditary. My mother hides in cupboards. Oh, really? If it comes on again, you shall probably all see me take a violent plunge into this chest. Can you get in or is it locked? Brandon, I said, is the chest locked? Sorry, I was looking for a match. Uh, you can get into it if you want to. Isn't there a lock on it, though? Yes, there is. But we've forgotten, Rupert. He's got a murdered man in there. <laughs> That's right. Put your finger on this rope, Kenneth. The parcel won't hold still. Right. Now, he's been committing murder. <laughs> there. Now the rope's right. Isn't that right, Brandon? Ah, Lila, you don't know how near the mark you are. Oh, but I know exactly what's inside that chest. What? A body. A dead body. What sort? An old, old man. You did him in for the gold fillings in his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I see you've been following me. Mm, let's see. Oh, it is locked, isn't it? A padlock at that. What have you got in it, Brandon? You've told us. Now I'm just dying. Where's the key? Uh, in my waistcoat pocket. Well, I shan't rest till I look inside. Hand it over. I'm hanged if I do. But why not? 
If you're really innocent, my dear. But I'm not. My hands are red with a crime committed less than three hours ago. If I had a strong man here, he'd force the key from you. But, um, I'll be your strong man, Lila. Now then, Brandon, hand it over, or it'll be the worse for you. <laughs> uh, come and... come and get it, Kenneth. Um, but I'll, uh, uh, and I'll give him ten seconds, eh, Lila? Afraid, Kenneth? Oh, of course not. Um, one... Two, three, four... Brandon! Five, six... Do surrender. Seven, eight... No. Nine, ten... Oh. 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 Give it here, Brandon! No! no. What men will do for me? Come on. Get away from me, Kenneth. There! Oh! My, my, my arm! Oh! Oh! oh. I, I, I... I say, Brandon, you... Could have broken my arm, you know. Gave it an absolutely foul tug. Kenneth, I'm so sorry. Really. Uh, sorry, Lila. I tried. I think he's a beast. Only a desperate criminal. How fearfully interested in crime we all seem tonight. Why, we can't even let Brandon commit this in peace. Rupert, did you mean it before when you said you approved of murder? Yes, I suppose so. Oh, but you couldn't. Your conscience wouldn't let you. Ah, but have I a conscience? He's quite right. And for one who hasn't a conscience, I can understand murder being an entirely engrossing adventure. You mean a motiveless murder? Yes. Doing someone in for fun. What a peculiar notion of fun. The only trouble with that sort of thing is you're bound to be found out. Why should you be found out? Because, my dear Brandon, it would not be motiveless at all. It would have a quite clear motive, vanity. Such a criminal would be quite unable to keep from talking about it. He can't. He won't hide. He wants to boast. To give himself away, they always do. Suppose your murderer, I mean a really clever, brilliant and competent murderer, knew that and went out of his way not to be caught. I'm talking of a genius at it. You are. But then he couldn't help talking about the fact that he was so brilliantly clever. He'd give himself away just the same. But suppose that he was so I very... Beg your pardon, Brandon. Of course, Sir Johnston. I must be offered. I should like to use your phone, if I may. Of course. On the table, sir. Thank you. Grosvenor 8432. Yes. It's about time I'm off, Brandon. Uh, can I drop you somewhere? Hello? Oh. No, thank you. Oh, oh is that you, my dear? I'll get a cab. Well, it's no trouble. No, he's not here. But uh, I, I, I thought he, he, he was home. Yes, yes, I, I, I'll be along soon. Bye. Uh, Lila. Yes, Sir Johnston. Uh, Ronald uh, hasn't come back. You said he'd been to the Colosseum tonight, sir? Mm, that's right. The bill was over two hours ago. Mm, he was expected back for tea. Uh, uh, my wife is worried. Well, he probably had trouble getting a cab in the rain. He'll be there when you get home. Yes, yes, I, I expect so. I have your hats and coats in the hall. I... I've never known Ronald to fail an appointment. Very odd. Well, thank you for a charming evening. I shall always remember it when I read the books you so kindly gave me. No pleasure, sir. I'll help you on with your things. Good night, Mr. Cadell. Oh, but I'm leaving now as well. Night, Brandon. Good night, Good night, night, my boy. Good night. They're gone. Gone. Grano, I think I'll sit down. Well, well. I've got to have another, Brandon. I thought he'd got onto it. Who? Rupert. So did I. For a few moments. But that's what gave spice to the evening. <laughs> he hadn't. You sure he hadn't? Quite sure. 
I sometimes rather wish he had. If he had been in on this, you wouldn't have gotten drunk, Grana. I'm not drunk. A little blurred, that's all. That's all. What's it? What? Thought I heard something. Oh, be yourself, Grana. I thought it was the bell. Well, what of it? I'll go. Pour me a drink, will you, Grana? Oh. Oh, Rupert. I left my cigarette case, Brandon. I don't suppose you've seen it? No. No, I haven't. May I come in and look about? Of course. Grano, Rupert's forgotten his cigarette case. As a matter of fact, I... <laughs> I thought you might give me another drink. Mind if I sit down? No. Soda, Rupert? Uh, a splash. Cigarette, Brandon. Oh, 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 fancy. I had the case in my pocket all the time. Oh, here's your drink. Ah. Well, would you mind turning off the big light, eh? What's wrong with the light? You see, I'm a creature of half-lights. They make me more comfortable. I hope you're, you're not going to make yourself too comfortable, Rupert. You know, we've got to be off before long. Oh, yes. What's the time? Um, 25 to 11. Oh. Well, I expect you're wanting to get rid of me. Not at all, Rupert. I hope not. I'm full of melancholy. And I don't want to go home. You must bear with me. It's been a strange evening. Strange evening? Why? Why strange? I can't tell you that's my trouble. I suppose it's the thunder and one thing and another... Thunder always upsets me. Besides, I'm always melancholy at this hour. Five and twenty to eleven. It's a curious hour. Did you ever read Goldsmith's Night Piece? No. I can't actually recall it. No. You should. It's about the city at night. I shall do his night piece up to date one of these days and... I shall make it five and twenty to eleven. It's a wonderful hour. I'm particularly susceptible to it. Why so wonderful? Oh, because it is. I think the hour when London asks why, when it wants to know what it's all about, when the tedium... And activity and the folly of pleasure are equally transparent. It is the hour of winking advertisement signs and taxis and buses, traffic blocks. It is the hour when jaded London theater audiences are settling down in the darkness to the last acts of plays of which they know they knew more only too well. They know that when the curtain's down, it'll be just a question of... God save the queen, and they'll be bundled out into the chilly and possibly rainy night where they'll have to fight for taxis or rush for trains or somehow transport themselves home to a cold supper. And the prospect of another day tomorrow, exactly similar to that which has passed. For others, further horrors are waiting the nightclubs and cabarets have not yet begun, but they will do so very soon. I could enlarge upon the idea indefinitely. Five and twenty to eleven. A horrible hour. A macabre hour. For it is not only the hour of pleasure ended. It is the hour when pleasure has been found wanting. There. That's what this hour means to me. And it has, moreover, been thundery. Five and twenty to eleven. Yes, Rupert. 
But by the time you have finished making your speech, it will be eleven o'clock. In brief, my dear Rupert, you see no earthly object in living. I fear not. Do you? I? Yes. Of course I do. But then I'm interested in things. Why don't you take up exploring, or cricket, or making love, or golf, or finance, or lecturing? Or as you suggested this evening, murder. Or as you say, murder. And now, Rupert, if you've finished your drink, we've really got a bit of packing to do. Can't be so cruel. It's raining out. Can't I have another drink? Certainly, Rupert, but Grano and I really must pack. Well, can't I stay and watch you? You know, I believe you're a bit blotto tonight, too. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I'll tell you what, I'll stay and see you off. Pour me another drink, Brendan. You've had enough. Mind your own business. Well, Rupert, it doesn't look as if we'll get off with Grano in this state at all. I'm perfectly sober. Grano. Why does he want to stay and see us off? That's what I want to know. My dear Grano, Rupert has no earthly reason for staying. Come along, Rupert. Finish up now and let me take care of him. Oh, I've got to go then. What do you mean, Rupert? You've got to go. <laughs> I don't want you to go. You don't? No. All right, then. I'll stay. Don't bother. I'll mix myself another drink. You're in a queer mood tonight, Rupert. One has inspirations, you know. Well, cheers. I shan't be long now. No hurry. Mind if I clear? You know, I don't feel like driving tonight after all. No, there's something in the air tonight. Did you notice Sir Johnson's exit? No. What about it? Rather subdued, I thought. And pathetic. Oh, uh, Grano, I believe this is yours. What? This, this little blue ticket to the Coliseum, I fancy. He's got it. Brendan, he's got it. Hold your tongue, Grano. I believe it came from your waistcoat pocket, Grano. No. It was sticking out, you know, and I... Uh, no. I acquired it uh, from you shortly after... Some... He's got it. He's got it. Quiet, no. Grano. Quiet. Hold your tongue. Oh, 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 oh. Rupert, Grano is obviously upset. Would you oblige me by leaving us? Why don't you tell me your trouble, Brandon? I might be able to help. Are you going or are you not? No, Brandon. I'm not. You see, I'm rather awkwardly situated. You are something more than that, my friend. Oh? How is that? You are very dangerously situated. Uh, perhaps not. I have a revolver, Brandon. It's loaded. Oh? With the safety off, you observe. I see and it. Besides, I have a far greater weapon here. What's that? A whistle. A policeman gave it to me. I think we need a bit of air. And when did he give it to you? Right after I left here. Before I came back for my, uh, cigarette case. He's waiting at the corner within, within earshot. What do you want from me, Rupert? The truth about this blue ticket and about that chest. The truth? What do you mean, Rupert? If you're hopeless, hopelessly drunk, you'd, you'd better go home. I mean, it's more than suspicion. Brandon, I phoned this house at a quarter of nine and heard Grano crying there, crying for the dark. <laughs> Good heavens, what do you suspect? Murder. The murder of Ronald Kentley. <laughs> Rupert, hear that, Grano. He suspects us of murder. It's too rich. Are you trying to bluff me? Bluff you, you drunken sot. Get on out of here. Blow your little whistle. Bring in your policeman. Get out. Do what you like. What I like, I should like to see inside of that chest. See the inside of that chest. You can see the inside of 50 chests. Now get on out. You're drunk. Possibly. Nevertheless, may I look inside that chest? Yes. Very well. I will. Go on. What are you waiting for? Keep back. Sit down. Sit down in that chair. Sit down. <laughs> now the chest. It's uh, locked. Padlocked. What of it? Where's the key? I don't know. Why should I know? Upstairs, I think. Upstairs? Shall I go get it? Stay seated, Brandon. Pray... 
I can shoot the lock off. Must I? Must I? Here's your key. Here. Thank you. Now look and get what's coming to you. Thank you. Get back in that chair. You'll be sorry, Rupert. You'll be sorry. Sit down. Talk to your poor Ronald Kentley. What had he done to you? Rupert, listen. Listen to me. I want to explain. Explain? I'm at your mercy now. I can explain. Judge me, but listen. Well, Rupert, you're an enlightened man, aren't you? Yes. It's in your power to have me hang. Yes. Remember our talk tonight about the old Bailey and justice? Well, you said it yourself. You wouldn't be giving us up to justice. And something else. You're not a man of morals, are you? No, I'm not. Now, listen, Rupert, listen. We have done this thing, Grano and I, for adventure and danger. You read Nietzsche, don't you, Rupert? Yes. He tells us to live dangerously. You know he has no more respect for individual life than you. He tells us to live dangerously, and we have. We've done this thing. Others only talk. Do you understand? Listen, Rupert, you're the one man to understand. You can't give us up. Two lives can't recall one. Our lives are in your hands. You can't kill us. You can't kill. You're not a murderer, Rupert. What are you? You are not a slave to your time. In the days of the Borgias, you'd have thought nothing of this. You're an emancipated man. You can't give us up. Rupert, you can't. You brought up my own words to my face. And a man should stand by his words... I'll never trust in logic again, ever. You imply I hold life cheap. You're right. Your own included. What do you mean? I mean... I mean you've taken by strangulation a very harmless and helpless fellow creature of 20 years. I mean that in that chest now lie the staring and futile remains of something that four hours ago lived and laughed. And ran and found it good. Laughed as you could never laugh. And ran as you could never run. I mean that for your cruel and scheming pleasure, you have committed a sin and blasphemy against that very life which you now find so precious. And you have done more than this. You have not only killed him, you have rotted the lives of all those to whom he was dear. You've dragged here his father, an equally harmless old man, and a girl who loved him, and a friend, and played on him tonight an infamous lewd jest, and a bad jest of that. And if you think, as your type of philosopher generally does, that all life is nothing but a bad jest, then you will now have the pleasure of seeing it played upon yourselves. What are you saying? What are you doing? It's not what I'm doing, Brandon. It's what society is going to do. And what will happen to you at the hands of society, I cannot say. But I can give you a pretty shrewd guess. Rupert! Rupert, no! You are going to hang, you swine. Hang, both of you! You have just heard the best plays production of Rope by Patrick Hamilton, starring Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory. And here again is your host, drama critic John Chapman. I suppose there are two morals to this excellent melodrama. It's been very well played by Mr. Hatfield and Mr. Jory and their company. I'd say that one of the morals is that Murder is nasty business. And the other one is that very often it makes for good theater, as it has this evening, I think. And now, let's think about next week. We like to mix our plays up on this program, so the next one will be a comedy. 
Samson Raffleson's Skylark, which was a great success for the late Gertrude Lawrence and Donald Cook. Mr. Cook will be playing his original role for us, and Miss Lawrence's part will be played by June Havoc. This is Chapman saying goodbye until next Friday. Again, may we call your attention to next week's program on best plays, the comedy, the gay comedy of Samson Rachelson Skylark. The parts will be played by Donald Cook, who appeared in the original role, and Miss Lawrence's part will be played by June Happen. You're most cordially invited to attend next week at the same time for best plays. Rope by Patrick Hamilton was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. In the cast were heard Hatfield as Brandon, Victor Jory as Rupert, Lloyd Bachner as Grenelow, William Podmore as Sabot, Ivor Francis as Raglan, Deirdre Owens as Lila, and Guy Spall as Sir Johnston. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Fred Way. This is Robert Denton speaking. Well, that'll just about do it. 